professor mv narayan it would be ridiculous to introduce this person to a pack of scholars and academics in literature it will be like uh, stating mamuti is the best actor or like introducing amitabh bachchan to a pack of film enthusiasts because as long as we are uh, part of this ever evolving uh, field of culture studies this one name of professor mv narayan absolutely needs no words of introduction yet the compulsions of a formal program makes me list out a few of his credentials from a long catalog of acclaims and accredits he had been the professor in the department of english and director of the school of languages at the university of calicut holds his phd from the university of exeter uk with his extensive teaching experience of over 3 decades he had been a visiting professor to many universities including sharja university miyazaki international university japan his articles have appeared in tdr comparative culture all rulage and cambridge published he has been on the curatorial committee of international theater festivals of kerala he is a recipient of the sahitya academy award all of his expertise and merits found its culmination when he ascended his career ladder and adorned the eminent position of the vice chancellor of sri shankaracharya university of kerala it's indeed a fortune to have professor mv narayan here with us i humbly request professor mv narayan to inaugurate the second edition of our international conference on culinary aesthetics and culture studies and to deliver the keynote lecture the president of the function reverend munshi dr pais wali kandathi Dr. Neil Thompson, Professor K.V. Thomas, Dr. Anita Matum, Ms. Anu Joy Chakravarti, faculty, researchers, students and friends. That introduction was a bit too much. Uh, one uh, feels embarrassed because it's like all your past misdeeds coming to face you in reality and being pulled up or being asked to account for them but that aside i'm extremely happy to be here uh, a college which i visited earlier for a very similar uh, seminar on cultural studies again and i was reminded by the head of the department that i had spoken on tin to moon at that point of time i don't remember that entirely uh, but it is certainly a pleasure to come back here where people remember some of your previous misdeeds again the second thing is that it's a distinct pleasure to be part of a seminar or a function like this which is chaired by the manager of an institution who is by every right a scholar an academic a teacher uh and who has served and done his best for the academic culture of the country and elsewhere so to share this podium with uh reverend father pais malikandathan is definitely another great pleasure one of the problems that you find in many institutions these days and this institution is obviously an exception is that they are led by people who rarely have any idea of what academics is all about the fact that your manager could come up and stand here and give you a historical perspective about the way in which your breakfast table is there and how in a certain sense of speaking the so called kerala traditional food is ultimately drawn from elsewhere and that there is very little keralaite in what you eat may induce in you a certain sense of plurality a certain sense of how despite the ways in which we identify ourselves as different from others there are these connections there are these linkages that bring us together sometimes even unconsciously so 
Thank you, Dr. Pais Malikan Dathil, for that extremely interesting introductory presidential address. Now, I'm not really sure what I should speak about today. Because, on the one hand, this is not entirely my area, and I understand that Dr. Shweta Anthony is an expert, and so I would probably do disservice in trying to actually come up with a very scholarly lecture, which, for which I don't have the grounding, let us be very honest about it. But I thought I'll share with you certain apprehensions or certain anxieties that I have as part of living in the present, in this country, in this state, and in this world, and that too as something that can be articulated in terms of our practice of eating and the ways in which we actually get involved, get engaged in that practice itself. I would submit here that I'm a bit surprised that such a topic has been chosen at this point of time. And I'm kind of intrigued whether the topic came first or the incidents that, is, that are so uppermost in our mind right now came first, which inspired which or whether there is some kind of a deeper unconscious connection among these things is worthy of consideration. And because food has come up in our media, in our thoughts, in our discussions, in our arguments of late, probably not entirely for aesthetic reasons, but for quite pronouncedly political reasons, and where it may not be possible for one to speak about aesthetics as purely the study of beauty in the Kantian sense of uh, the Enlightenment philosophy, but aesthetics is necessarily to be seen in terms of the political dimensions of the same, or the social dimensions of the same, and how a certain thing is considered to be beautiful, or the opposite of that, that is nothing primarily to do with the object, and probably much more to do with the position of the subject who actually observes or who actually engages with that particular object itself. And, and invariably in that sense, when we look at culinary aesthetics or the aesthetics of food, some of the questions that really come up is why is it that I find a certain food appealing while another person doesn't find it so. Why is it that I find a certain culinary smell to be delectable, which was a word used here, uh, while someone else may find it to be a rather opprobrious smell? Why is it that I find the sight of a certain kind of food to be something that inspires my appetite, while for someone else, that may be the invitation to throw up. Now, are these questions ultimately, or these experiences, let us say, which are primarily somatic in nature, physical, bodily in nature, are these things or questions that can be reduced to the body? Or are they questions that are ultimately to do with the way in which we have practiced our food? way in which food has become so implicated within the whole process of how we live our life, how we understand ourselves, where we position ourselves, vis-a-vis -vis not just ourselves but others. What are the agonistics, the oppositions, the affinities that actually define the way in which we live our life and how food plays a kind of role in that. So I'd rather speak less about the beautiful aspect of aesthetics and more about the political aspect of our culinary aesthetics. Let me mention three 
different incidents. The first incident is something that all of you here are quite aware of, something the reverberations of which are still continuing today, and that is to do with the state youth festival that took place in Calicut quite recently. There was this whole controversy about the food that was being served, where the food that was served on the instructions of the government was entirely vegetarian. And there were questions asked why only vegetarian food was being offered to the students, while in fact maybe a majority, if not the entire set, would probably have preferred non-vegetarian. Given also the fact that Calicut is famed for its non-vegetarian food. Now, we have seen perorations from both sides. We have seen perorations or articulations which defend vegetarianism in terms of hygiene, health, the maintenance of standards when you have huge quantities of food being prepared. On the other, you have also seen or heard articulations about there is a very strong streak of Brahminism or a certain kind of upper caste mentality which goes into the privileging of the vegetarian mode of food. And caught in the middle of all this was one person who willy-nilly was asked to be instructed to cook vegetarian food and because of this particular positioning within the caste structure, probably due to no volitional or willing participation of his own, came to be demonized terribly, both from this side as well as the other side. I'm not interested in taking sides, but what I was surprised with in that entire, you know, shall I say, verbal diarrhea that actually figured on our social media is this remarkable ignorance or reluctance of people to look at their own positions and see the implications, the ideological implications of what they themselves are saying. Most of the people engaged in the debate, whether it was for vegetarianism or for non-vegetarianism, or whatever, seemed to be blissfully unaware that their own positions or the way in which they looked at the whole issue was quite political in nature. On the contrary, they seemed to be fully obsessed with the idea of presenting what they were doing as a veritable truth, either in terms of community justice, or in terms of doing justice to the students, or in terms of justifying the chef, and so on and so forth. But one thing became very clear through that. And that thing is that whether we like it or not, food is not just food. Food is much, much more than what we eat or consume or digest. That food can never be separated, divorced from the representations of food. That whatever you're eating, whether you like it or not, whatever you're eating in the act of eating it or in the act of not eating it, in the act of accepting something or in the act of not accepting something, you're making a statement of yourself. You're making a statement about the way in which you relate to your society. You're actually making a statement of how you see the world around you. Food is not just food. Food, like many other cultural practices, is a conscious as well as unconscious way of signifying who you are, what you are, how you think about things, how you experience things, etc., etc. And that is where, as I said, my grouse lay. People who are considered scholars, people who are considered political commentators, 
people who consider themselves to be intellectuals seem to take part in this whole debate without ever pausing for a moment and looking at their own positions and seeing why they were speaking the way they did or what prompted them to actually articulate the ideas that they did. That's the first incident. <coughs> The second one is again something that happened quite recently and something that happened within social media. It had to do with a certain food item that our respected principal referred to here, Kurimandi. A certain writer who was earlier a film actor and who used to write extremely interesting little anecdotal writings looking at those aspects of life which are usually not looked at seriously or ignored providing us with what one would call a perspective a lighter perspective of course of life i'm speaking of none other than vk sri ram V.K. Sri Raman, in his own very flippant manner, he is given to flippancy. If everyone says that this song is good, he has this, what shall I say, uncontainable tendency to say, no, it's bad. He has to do that. that is, that's the kind of person he is. He's, he, he is not a conformist in any way. So in a very light way, light manner, he wrote in one of his Facebook posts, that we should actually proclaim a moratorium on Kurimandi. He had his own reasons for that. He said, there is so much Kurimandi here, there are so many restaurants, and that some of the other, I mean, he was a great fan of biryani, he said, what about biryani? What about Kerala's traditional food, the parota? Why, we are losing all this due to the onslaught it was, of course, written in a rather contradictory, ironic manner. It did not really mean any of it. But poor man, he thought it was going to raise a laugh among people. But far from laughter, it raised the ire of so many people. People became quite angry and furious. And Vikki Sri Raman was accused, again, of all things, Ramanism upper caste tendencies, and that he is an advocate of everything that is inimical to culinary democracy, to the idea that all kinds of food are acceptable, and so on and so forth. The man had no idea what he did. He was just coming up with a little anecdote, but suddenly there is this whole, whole storm raging around him. I remember him asking me, what is happening? You know. And so, a couple of weeks later, he comes out with a statement saying, I withdraw my comment. I'm not going to continue with this. I accept it. But then, because he is given to irony, at the same time, at the end, he added, but I still hold to my position that Kulimandi should be prohibited. Why does this right? He withdrew everything, but he said this. Number two. Number three is a much more serious event. And this happened in 2015. It happened in a place called Dadri in Uttar Pradesh, where a poor laborer, agricultural laborer, or a person with a little bit of a farm called Muhammad Akhlaq, was attacked in his home. People rushed into his house and into the kitchen because he claimed that he was hiding beef in his refrigerator. The announcement that he was hiding beef in his refrigerator was made by some people connected with the local temple. They came in there, they found some meat in his refrigerator, dragged out Muhammad Aklaq and his son, 
both were beaten, severely beaten, physically assaulted. A clerk died a couple of days later in hospital. Some of you may have heard, or it's major, definitely you've heard this. This was during a time when several people belonging to a certain community was being demonized and assaulted. Food is something for which you kill. Food is something for which you may have to die. Food is no small matter. Now the question as to whether there was beef in his refrigerator, whether one should eat beef or not is another question. Simple fact, was it beef that was there in his refrigerator? Later forensic studies and analysis clearly proved that it was not beef, but that it was mutton. And mutton, there is no prohibition on mutton. Either Hindu or Muslim prohibition, it's not there, mutton is acceptable to everyone. But the representation that it is beef and the idea that it is something that cannot be consumed and that it is against the dictates of a certain majority community, of a certain majority religion, I'm not sure it's religion, but let's say it's community, and where it leads to the assault, the invasion of a person's home and the assault of a person and his family, which eventually culminated in his death, puts the whole question of food at a very, very different level. That's why I said food is not just food. Food is always connected to representations of the same. And representations, ladies and gentlemen, can never be seen apart from the structures, the processes, and the articulations of power and the way in which culture or community interentangle so as to create a certain reality that we experience as if in an unmediated manner, but always mediated by the ideology, especially the hegemonic ideology that function within a society. I started with these three incidents or episodes in order to indicate that especially in a modern context or in the context of what one would call a public kind of life where the division between the private and the public has steadily been eroded so much so that there is no real distinction at all and where everything private also becomes public and where the public invades into the privacy of your homes, into the privacy of your bedrooms, into the privacy of your bathrooms. Food is not just an individual matter, nor even is it a matter of taste, nor even is it simply a question of what you like or do not like. Now taking these three examples again, let us start asking questions too. There's an idea that just came up now. Let us ask and start asking questions today. It's going to be interesting. In case, in the case of the first incident regarding our school youth festival, when people people who objected to the idea that there should be non-vegetarian food served and the use of only Brahminical food or vegetarian food is a Brahminical kind of approach. If we ask them, then will it be okay for you if we serve food that is served in Japan and Korea, how will they respond? Non-vegetarian food. What is the food served in Japan and Korea as part of non-vegetarian? Fair. In Japan, you have a thing called sashimi. Sashimi is fresh fish, uncooked. It is eaten with certain sauces and certain kinds of garnishes, fresh off the, of the sea, hardly an hour or two 
and while the fish is there, sometimes even breathing, it is cut open, the skin is removed, and those parts which are eatable, especially the belly side, is opened up so that you can actually take it out with the chopsticks and eat fresh, raw fish meat. Do you like to eat that? I've eaten that. It's tasty. It's really good. Why wouldn't you like to eat that? No, you don't have to answer. If you go to Korea, it becomes even more interesting. In Korea, you may find extremely beautiful dishes served on little saucers. Unlike us Keralites and Indians where we have this plate heaped with rice and over which you like like this. So, uh, what they have are these small little receptacles in which little things come on them. So sometimes if you happen to go to Korea and you find this extremely alluring, nice, red colored meat wound around a bee an asparagus and brought with a nice garnish and it's so inviting think twice before you pop it into your mouth ask what it is because it could either be horse meat or dog meat do you understand what I'm saying? Now when we get into the business of judgment and say the exclusion of one kind of food is connected with certain structures of power which is absolutely right and which is really a truism in terms of the political way in which food is, de is, is deployed one will also have to consider the possibility that one is also determined, limited by one's own ideological or cultural upbringing, which makes certain food acceptable, certain other food not acceptable. Now, this is not just with non-vegetarian food. I'll ask the same with vegetarian people. Is everything all right if purely vegetables are eaten? Because if some people claim, as vegetarians most often do, that they're against killing, that they're against the taking of life, and that they are basically eating what nature provides us with, <laughs> I'll ask them a simple question here in Kerala especially. പായല് ജപ്പാനിലും കൊറിയയിലും സൗത്ത് ഈസ്റ്റ് ഏഷ്യയിലും മുഴുവൻ പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട് ഉപയോഗിക്കുന്നതാണ് in uh, seaweed paper with an omishu or a cherry or probably a pickle, some kind of a pickle fruit at the center of it, which they eat along with the, the what do you call the, the, the paper, uh, the seaweed paper. Will our vegetarians eat that? No. Ladies and gentlemen, neither vegetarianism is vegetarianism nor non-vegetarianism is non-vegetarianism. It is not a division between eating vegetables and non-vegetables. It is another set of di dynamics which is working there. It is not a question of the division between the plant world and the animal world. It is the question of divisions within each of these worlds where you are used to certain things, you're not exposed to certain things, and as a result of which, you have naturalized your own food to think, to accept, to insist, 
and then be aggressively defensive of your own food habits. It is what is essentially, why are people eating uh, seaweed in Japan? Why are uh, uh, people eating uh, horse meat in Korea? You eat what is available. Whatever is available in a certain place, you eat that. Why do you have people in Singapore or Malaysia eating much more squid than you have here? Or see, uh, uh, what do you call, um, uh, seafood? Because it's available. You can only eat what is available. And you can't expect to have kumblanya everywhere in the world. You can only eat what is locally available. And food habits actually are generated from what is available and become a culture. And then the ground, the reality, the physical and shall I say material reality from which that food habit actually arose come to be forgotten. It is erased from your memory and you think this is the right thing to do. And what everyone else does is a wrong thing to do. So none, all three of these examples there are other questions which can be asked, but I just indicated a way of what one would call denaturalizing our own food habits and realizing that none of these are natural, none of these are divinely ordained as some religious denominations would have it. None of these are natural to the human being. They are all, in a certain way, cultural. Now, coming to another aspect, at the same time, we realize that food cultures are almost always based upon the ideas or practices of exclusion. Emin Srinivas, the so-called the famed father of Indian anthropology, much earlier from all this, in the 1960s, came up with this notion of Sanskritization. And probably one of the kernel, shall I say, uh, not ideas or experiences, human experiences, that he presented as evidence or example of the process of Sanskritization was what usually happened with food. He gives a hypothetical ex example of two communities or two groups within one community, most often within one caste community, two distinct groups, either in two different villages or engaged in professional activity which is slightly different from the other, but equal groups, groups equal in financial economic status, groups equal in terms of the caste status in social status, and groups which are especially defined by the fact that they eat together and they marry among themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Levi-Strauss, the great structuralist anthropologist, has observed that there are only two major questions in culture, and that is, who do you eat with? Not who do you eat, what do you eat? Who do you eat with and who do you sleep with? They eat and these are basically the two, the two questions, the two anthropological questions. So what Emin Srinivas found out was, if you have two such communities, and by some quirk of history, one of this one group becomes financially more affluent, or get closer to the structures of power, they became more powerful before. Consider that. Now, two groups which are equal socially, culturally, financially, one goes up 
and when they grow up they have an inherent need to define themselves as different from that group with which they were equal before oh you know dog or bari le oru pudu panakkara aanu nu parayunna sir so they are no longer part of us we are different because we are higher in social hierarchy we are greater how do they do that what is the modus operandi what is a particular technique with which they redefine their own status one oft repeated method that communities employ and you find that throughout history is a method whereby they reject stop eating one item of food which they had eaten till then and which still continues to be eaten by the other group with which they were equal now when they stop eating this they become higher these people become lower and because they still continue to eat that this community or this group cannot eat any more with the others because they eat that and the next step is oh, oh we can't marry from that community why after a while this whole question comes to be presented in terms of that central category that usually defines not just food but a number of other practices of culture purity and impurity they are impure they are not as pure as we are we vouchshake we reject we give up something now this is the most important thing when we talk of no offense men yeah but when you talk of sanyasa usually sanyasa is giving up something but let us also remember that in giving up something you are actually acquiring something intangible in terms of power so sanyasa that which is given away that which is given up here to you are giving up something an item of food that you did eat till that point of time but then later that giving up provides you with the circumstances of giving you a greater status within culture and within society there are any number of instances like that especially in the hindu community for instance and this is where we need to look at neo brahmanism there are i'm not making a political speech by any means i'm not i'm not trying to take the advocacy of one side or the other but as cultural practitioners as students of humanities there are certain things which we need to understand non vegetarianism or vegetarianism has never been part of the shall i say the the practical systems of what we today call by the name of hinduism or what went earlier as part of the vedic religion or the number of other belief systems that were part in the uttarakhanda of the ramayana which we believe was written maybe as late as the second century ad and some claim it is much earlier the 3rd century bc there is a very interesting little part where sita is at valmiki's permitted she has been rejected by rama and she is living at valmiki's hermitage she has already given birth to lava and kusha and then janaka is coming sita's father is coming to a you know, on a visit to all his hermitage without knowing that sita is there so when he comes or when he is about to arrive there is a passage where the tabaswinis the sanyasins the lady sanyasins of valmiki's hermitage discuss what should be served to janaka and his entourage and they decide that it should be venison the meat of the deer and how is it to be cooked it is to be cooked in sesame oil ellanna oil in sesame oil and the spices that should be added to it the three shlokas which 
detailed. It, it, it explains, describes in detail how that deer meat should be cooked. Now, if you go through like that, there are any number of instances, incidents, where the eating of meat is very natural in the, uh, the entire discursive horizons, the discursive world of Hinduism. But at some point of time, even now you find places like Bengal, places like Orissa, places like Himachal Pradesh, where the Brahmins still continue to eat meat and fish. There is nothing anathema to that. Nothing. In terms of ritual propriety, there is nothing wrong with that. But at some point, by the 15th or 16th century, we find a process setting in which is as described by Eman Srinivas, where a certain segment of the Hindu population decided to give away, to do away with first certain kinds of meat, especially beef, and then progressively other kinds of meat, till finally, especially in South India, we have a Brahminic system where it is defined by primarily vegetarianism. It's medicine, it's not food. Once you change it from being food and de re re demarcate it, distinguish it as medicine, then it's okay. Because it's not something that you eat or consume happily. It is for medicine, for your purpose. So these are the ironies that you find, the fissures within that. Why am I saying this here in that context? What probably needs to be looked at is not merely the question of how you eat and what you eat, but the way in which those practices and those food items get represented so that we have structures of exclusion, structures of inclusion. We have hierarchies built upon that in terms of purity and impurity. We have entire systems of family and kinship rules or methodologies based upon what one eats and what one doesn't eat. There are entire structures, one should say, of discursive right and wrong, which are not in any way based upon any sacred text, but which have evolved as part of the daily practice of life, till finally we have certain notions, notions which do not have any kind of documentary authority or evidence, but which have become part of the mythos of a, and the ethos of, a, of communities, so much so that it is considered as sacred, and anything that goes against that as sacrilege. As cultural studies students and as practitioners, what all we can do is not to take sides in any of these, but to realize that each one of them I wouldn't want to go to the extent of saying they are vitiated. I would say they are influenced, determined by such conscious or unconscious concerns. So when we speak about food habits, when we speak about the aesthetics of food presentation in terms of plating, that is another thing. Probably the whole idea of culinary aesthetics is so closely linked to the practice of creating restaurants. I mean, how long since we've had restaurants? Restaurants is a very recent affair, as uh, Father mentioned, something, something very recent. It's hardly 70 or 80 years. We did not have restaurants in the 19th century or the 18th century. We had people, travelers, going to doorsteps and asking for food. Or probably they had inns then. Restaurant. When you have a restaurant and you have to present 
something. And the presentation, which is part of the marketing of food, which is connected with the motive and the practice of making profit, that is when this whole idea of aesthetics come to the fore. So much so that, that practice which is done in restaurants have slowly, slowly invaded our homes so that we ourselves have started to practice these presentation skills in home science, science rather than I'm, I'm sorry if there is home science here, I'll draw that. Other than local everybody could do that. Plating and you're not right to present. That's absolutely, it's, it's, it's very good. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from that. I like a very well laid plate. It's always welcome. Instead of things heaped up like this, it's always better to be well laid out. But what I'm saying is, there is something more than what you see. There is always a practice of signification connected with practices of power. I think I've spoken enough. If I bored you, I apologize. Thank you very much. I declare this, uh, this seminar open and I hope that every one of you will find it very profitable and beneficial. Thank you very much.